given about a hundred seminar talks during the last five years about what you will be able to do at Formax. I've given probably 200 study visits about what you can do at Formax. And today is the first workshop, at least the first one I'm participating in, where we have users showing results of what they're doing at Formax. Okay. You have to bear with me. I will still give a talk about what you could do at Formax. <laughs> Uh, okay, very briefly, a bit of history. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, the embryo of three shirts contacted Max4 about the possibility of uh, financing a, a beam, an instrument or beamline at Max4 with a focus on, on, on sort of new materials from the forest. As a way of also ensuring that three search members uh, get sufficient access to, to this infrastructure. After a few years, we found a solution where the Wallenberg Foundation has funded the construction of the beamline and the industry members of three search are funding the operation for 10 years. And, and oh, thanks to this, uh, Funding commitment, we can then guarantee three such members 50% of, of the user time at Formax. Now you will still go through the same application, peer-reviewed proposal uh, process as any user, but we do guarantee uh, at least 50% of the user time to three such members. Pharmaceutical industry has been doing research on R&D at Synchrotrons for decades. But a part, of, a part of pharmaceutical industry, this is the first example of Europe where an industrial sector goes in with such a big investment at the Synchrotron. I think it's a, it's a quite fantastic project. Okay, uh, you've all seen this picture in any one form or, or several. Many of you or most of you are interested in, in, in one way or another in hierarchical materials. So you want to study be able to study structure of your materials from nanoscales to several millimeters in the same sample and correlate those to, to the properties of the material. You also want to do that during a process to get a handle on, 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 on structure function relationships. This is how we typically justify Formax. I would like to I point out that it's, it's equally important for any heterogeneous material. Basically any real material that you process shows heterogeneity at some length scales. And there you have the same thing. You'd like to probe those heterogeneities on different length scales to understand the material properties. Well, it's, it's difficult to probe all these different length scales at once so with one technique. So to formax the solution is then to combine a few different techniques. On the microscopic length scales, from a micrometer up to millimeters, we can do tomographic imaging, like a CT scan at hospital, but at, at shorter length scales. And as Thomas pointed out, at shorter length scales, it's more convenient in many cases to do scattering experiments. So Thomas has a, had a good example of, uh, of, of, of light through a curtain. I always use the example of driving on a misty day and the light of your headlights will scatter. Uh, that's small angle scattering. In that case, it's scattering of optical light from water droplets in air. With x-rays, we can probe smaller length scales. But the idea is the same. Thomas also briefly mentioned a combination of these techniques called scanning sax-wax imaging. This is Fantastic technique that can actually bridge all these length scales, uh, but then you lose uh, temporal resolution. Now, uh, a nice feature of these techniques is that they're quite flexible. You can apply them to many different materials. They are fairly insensitive to sample uh, environments and such. Now, I would say a key feature of, of, of Formax is that we have a very high photon density, which means we can look at processes in situ. Thomas also mentioned this already. 
You work with complex materials, you spend a lot of time on developing those materials, those samples, you need a lot of expertise there. The techniques are rather complex. Uh, you need years in, of training to, to master those, to use these techniques uh, efficiently. By far the most efficient way of, of making use of these infrastructure is to collaborate. That is how we all started. This is what Formax looks like, or the end-station Formax, you'll see it today. And this is then a unique instrument for, for studying hierarchical materials. What we have here is a this is a tomography microscope for full field imaging. This one we can move in and out of, of the beam. We have here behind, we have a, a detector for measuring wide angle scattering. That one we can also move in and out of the beam. Inside this large vacuum vessel we have a detector for small angle scattering. This is a very flexible technique where depending on your experiment we can choose a subset of, of detectors a subset of techniques that are best suited for your particular experiment. Given the funding, we also made an effort to make this as useful as possible for fibrous materials. An example here is, is, is this wax detector. That's a custom detector with a hole in the center. And then we can measure diffraction in, in any direction in the scattering pail while then passing through the small angle scattering signal on, onto the axis detector. And that's very important if you want to map out orientation of fibrils within a sample. You've seen these slides a few times, uh, how tomography works. You, you place your sample in a large X-ray beam, you measure an X-ray projection, pretty much like uh, Röntgen did uh, 120 years ago. If you rotate your sample, you take several projections, and you do a lot of magic in the computer, you can, uh, you can uh, deduce the internal three-dimensional structure of, of the sample. And since you have that electronically on your computer, you can play around with it. You can, you can take any sort of 2D slice, you can zoom in, you can, <coughs> you can do a lot of data analysis. Or you can work with the, with the 3D structure, um, model here. You now you can apply tensile stress, for example. Oh, sorry. Tensile stress, you can, uh, you can see how this 3D structure evolves. You can deduce how strain fields evolve inside the sample, for example. For biological samples, you can also make use of the fact that X-rays are refracted by the sample. In this case, we have some uh, polymer composite material. The contrast is not uh, great. If you play around with the distance between the sample and the detector, you can enhance the contrast uh, by, by refraction. So we have tricks of, uh, of improving contrast if needed. So at Formax then, we'll be able to, with tomography, to look at length scales from about a micrometer to five millimeters. And we will be able to do a 3D image in less than a second. This is one of the first uh, tomographic reconstructions we did at, at Formax. In case you don't recognize it, it's a cocktail pick without olive, olive and uh, dry martini. <laughs> okay, small angle scattering. Uh, we already heard, we put the sample in the beam, we shine x-rays on it, we measure uh, scattering behind the sample. We get an intensity curve and from that one we can deduce the nanoscale structure. Now what Thomas didn't highlight, but it was implied in his, his, his talk, is that we're measuring an average statistics of, of the nanoscale features in the sample. If you have a complex sample with many different nanoscale compositions, you will have a very complex scattering pattern. You'll, you'll measure some sort of average of these. Alternatively, if you have a uh, uh, inhomogeneous sample or he heterogeneous sample where the structure varies depending on where in your sample you're studying, you'll see an average of this. Uh, so standard sucks or wax is not always the best. 
method for studying your samples. You can get around that by doing what we call scanning sax wax imaging. So you focus down your beam, you scan your sample through the beam, at each position you take a, uh, make a sax experiment, a wax experiment, you use the feature, nanoscale features in those uh, scattering patterns to build a map of your sample on image. And then you have spatially resolved statistics uh, of, of, of the nanoscale features in your sample. What are we then really measuring? Oh, to, uh, scattering we can get, we, the scattering pattern contains structural information on let's say a nanometer to hundreds of nanometers. We probe those with a real space resolution which is basically defined by the size of your beam. At 4 max, this, uh, or typically you would run from maybe a micrometer to, to 50 micrometers or so, depending on your sample. And then the extent of your image is, is basically given by how much time do you have to scan. But typically you would go for something like 100 or 200 times the beam size. So you would, we would be talking here about hundreds of microns to 10 millimeters. Now these experiments can be time consuming, but think about it. You go from a nanometer up to 10 millimeters. You cover a lot of, of, of spatial length scales in, in one experiment. So it's really ideally suited for these kind of hierarchical or, or, or heterogeneous materials. Very schematically what an experiment would look like. You have your x-rays hitting your sample. You measure a scattering pattern. In this case it's bone. So we have, we have these anisotropic signals of, from collagen. In this case, you can use that, that, ana that anastropic information to deduce how collagen is, is oriented in the, in the bone sample locally. We can add a tomographic rotation. In this case, this is uh, looking at neurons in a, I think it was a rat brain. Basically, neurons are covered by myelin sheets. Myelin has a the peak in, in the small angle regime, so you can use that to map out concentration of neurons in the brain in, in three dimensions. If you're not happy with that, we can go one step further, we can add one more rotation and we can do something called tensor tomography, where you then, uh, in each uh, voxel of your sample, you can get information on how, how the fibers of fibrous of filaments are oriented, the, con the concentration and degree of orientation. Naturally, sort of the time scale of these experiments grows uh, very quickly. If you just do a line scan, that's about a second. If you do a two-dimensional scan, it's about two minutes. Uh, a tomography scan, then we're talking about a couple of hours, and a tensor tomography experiment, then we're talking about 10 hours or more. But it, is, it, 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 it does give you unique information. One thing I, I, I think will be very popular at Formax is, is to, to combine these. Or we can zoom into these hierarchical structures. So you would start by doing a, a, a full field tomographic imaging. So you get a high resolution 3D image of your sample. You can identify regions of interest. You can then zoom into those, do scanning based imaging to get uh, additional information on the nanoscale structures. We'll hear a lot of interesting uh, talks today about how you can apply these techniques yeah, or how they've been applied. I thought I'd spend a few minutes on, on, on a project that, uh, that we are developing at Formax that was not included in the program and that's combining X-ray scattering with uh, rheological experiments. This is a project that has been funded by a, a Formax pre-project and, and Chalmers. And again, collaboration. The only thing, reason we can do these experiments is because we have the group of Roland Kadar at Chalmers. They are really top-notch experts in rheology. And then combine that with the X-ray scattering expertise we have at, at, at Max4, and Terry and myself mainly. We have a, a, a rheometer at Formax. And you, or, and course at, or and more generally also at Max4 that you can use for experiments. 
and we have a few few sort of accessories, basic uh, geometries and so on. Now if you want to do more complex uh, rheological experiments at the same time, for the time being the best solution is to, to contact Roland. Sort of in, in line with the team of Formax, multi-scale structural characterization, we have one project ongoing, on development ongoing. So think you do rheological experiments. The rheological properties you measure with a rheometer, they are averaged over all the length scales in the system. So in this case, it's a, it's a sort of bulk measure for, for the viscoelastic properties. Now, if you want to get deeper insight, you probably want to study the underlying structure or the structural changes. And therefore, you will need to combine rheology with some, some means of studying a structure. There are several developments have been done. You could, for example, combine, I said on, on, on top, right, rheological experiments with polarized light imaging. Now, in these experiments, if you do this on a suspension of, of nanocellulose, the PLI then measures the ordering on, on, on mesoscale. So you, you see a uh, Maltese cross, yes, we have, we have ordering on, on mesoscale. From the colors we can draw some further conclusions. It's a very powerful technique. Another approach is to combine rheological experiments with SACS. And, uh, and uh, there, of course, then SACS gives you information on, on the nanoscale orientation of the, in this case, uh, nanocellulose particles in the suspension. The new thing that we're doing is, is to combine all these three techniques uh, in the same experiment. Now, this is still a work in progress. I won't show any results, and I think it's Roland or his group who should report, uh, report them. But we've, uh, we've done lots of experiments on systematically on, on, on CNC suspensions, it's a function of concentration, with added uh, salt, uh, surface functionalization of the nanoparticles. If you think then of, of what we measure, right, with, with PLI we would be measuring sort of the mesoscale ordering of, of, of the CNC. With small angle scattering, we would be measuring an ensemble average of, 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 of the in ordering of the individual nanoparticles. In most cases, we get the same sort of result. We have onset of ordering at the same uh, shear rates and so on. But we do have some cases, in, in particular with these surface functionalized uh, CNC, where, where where these don't quite match. And we're looking into the reasons, but, uh, yeah, but it, it is very interesting. Uh, I hope uh, Roland or his group can uh, present the results once we, we've uh, understood them. A second development that, uh, that I think might interest you is, is to combine DMA, so dynamical mechanical analysis, with, with SAX or VAX. And we have a setup where we can do this, where we can also control the temperature and relative humidity. So you, you see the picture here, we basically have here the uh, uh, a film, solid film that we twist. We do simultaneous sucks, box experiments and then we vary uh, the atmosphere. Or, or the conditions in the atmosphere. Uh, this is still very much uh, work in progress. We're a bit looking at, at suitable samples also. Uh, but this is typically what we would do, sort of we can measure the rheological properties while, while changing, in this case, relative humidity at a constant temperature. We can uh, do simultaneous Sux and Vox to look at then what is happening in the sample. In this case, we, we, did, we did coarse cracking of, of the sample, as you can see in the bottom right image. 
So if you're interested in this kind of experiment, please uh, get in contact with me or, or Roland. We've been a lot of people involved in this project. I counted we are more than 100 people at Max4. We probably are another 100 at different universities and companies who have been in some way involved. A thanks to everybody. And uh, yes, I'm open for questions.